Welcome to the Becoming Superhuman Podcast, where we interview extraordinary people to bring you the skills and strategies to overcome the impossible. And now, here's your host, Jonathan Levy. Before we get started today, I want to let you guys know that this episode is brought to you by the online course, Creating a Meaningful Life. Now, this course is the culmination of 20 years of work and research by my personal mentor and university professor, Linda Levine, and myself. Now, in it, we teach not only the skills and strategies that we've used and taught and which are being used by life coaches all over the world to create a life of fulfillment and balance, but we also go into how you can design your lifestyle, how you can improve in every aspect, all eight of the aspects that make a complete and rich life. And really, we share a lot of our wisdom. So if you've been inspired by the show, by some of the guests on here who seem to have these incredibly rich, fulfilling lives, I do encourage you to check it out. And of course, it is backed by a 30-day money-back guarantee. So to take advantage of a special coupon for listeners of this podcast, visit jle.vi slash meaning. All right, here we go with the show. Greetings, super friends, and welcome to today's show. You guys, today we are joined by Derek Rydall, an American screenwriter and author turned actor turned screenwriter turned screenplay consultant who's written a bunch of books and speaks all over the world. He's a pretty busy guy, as you can hear. He also runs a podcast called The Best Year of Your Life. But actually, he joins us today to talk about his latest book, which is called Emergence, Seven Steps for Radical Life Change. With a title like that, you know exactly why we had to have him on the show. And it's basically a book about enacting change in your life and in yourself and figuring out how to re-engage with ancient principles to live a better life. Now, Derek has a little bit of a different approach and a different mind mindset around personal growth and around self-help. And I know you guys every week get exposed to my be more, be better, be this, be that, grow, change every day, wake up better than you went to sleep. And I wanted to give you guys a different perspective, which is uh, a very interesting one around nurturing and honoring yourself. And I think during this episode, Derek definitely shares that alternate and no less wise perspective. So we talk about the law of emergence and some of the misconceptions around self-help and personal growth and why they might be flawed. We learn about Derek's story of his own emergence, uh, a very interesting near-death experience. And if you stick around to the end, you will also get a free copy of Derek's book, which was very generous of him to offer. So I hope you guys really enjoy the episode and get a hefty dose of inspiration and motivation from it. And if you do, of course, leave us a review and drop us a tweet, send us an email, anything like that, you know, definitely brightens our day, gives us a little inspiration and motivation. So without any further ado, let me present to you guys, Mr. Derek Rydall. Mr. Derek Rydell, welcome to the show, my friend. We're so glad to have you here today. Thank you. It's my honor and pleasure to be here, truly. Absolutely, absolutely. So, Derek, I tried to do a little bit of research, prepare myself, get ready for this interview, and I realized that you actually started out in acting and screenwriting and like my good friend, Dr. Anthony Mitivier, with screenplay consulting. So I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about the journey that brought you from there towards writing a book on kind of personal growth and spirituality. Sure. We don't have to get into my adult film career, right? (laughs) We can save that. We can just attach the YouTube (laughs) video later in the blog post. (laughs) Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, it's definitely been quite a journey. I mean, I am what I believe can be honestly defined as a renaissance man. They actually do exist. It's both a blessing and a curse. My mom told me when I was young, I could do anything I put my mind to. And she was right. And I sometimes hate her for having told me that. <laughs> so yeah, I've done a lot of things. I've lived many incarnations. And uh, I've always been on a journey. I've always been on a quest. I always knew that there was a bigger something going on in the universe and that there was something more to us than meets the eye, but I didn't have the language for it. You know, as a kid, I was always interested in my friends, different religions, and I'd go, you know, have Passover with my friend and I'd ask him the different, you know, understand his religion. I'd go and sit with my Buddhist friends and 
my Christian friends. And I just, I was always on a search, but I didn't really have the family or the environment to support any kind of deeper thinking. And I've also always been very, very creative in wanting to tell a story. And ultimately that uh, led me to become an actor. Mm -hmm. And I was a successful actor and I did film and TV and theater and commercials and was an up and coming actor. And in fact, was represented by same manager who had represented Tom Cruise. And cool. I was, you know, on track to be kind of the one, some, one of the new sort of brat pack or, you know, kind of actors. And then I had a very powerful spiritual opening. My life started to really go south. You know, I was on a good track on one hand professionally, but things started to not work anymore. And I would do everything that was right and I would get down to the wire and it would be against me and one other person, and I wouldn't get the job. But then the director would say, you were the best, and in fact, we changed the script because of how you did it, but we have to go with this person for this reason or that, or, ah. you know, my former roommate, or, you know, he's a celebrity, he's a star, you're not, you know, there's always a reason. And my life just started to feel like it was unwinding, and I endeavored to do all these personal growth things, you know, self-improvement, self-improvement therapy, self-improvement strategies, success strategies, all of this. And the more I did it, the only thing I improved after about a decade of self-improvement was I got very improved in my ability to articulate why my life was so screwed up. <laughs> you know, I became very eloquent at showing and describing why things weren't working, but I was more frustrated. I felt more inadequate. And the pain actually drove me to drink, to start to become addicted to drugs and alcohol, and then to almost die of an overdose. Wow. And I remember lying in the emergency room with the IV snaking out of my arm and just coming to consciousness and the doctor leaning over and whispering, you're lucky to be alive. And I remember in that moment feeling like that wasn't good news. Like, darn, I didn't succeed. You know, I'm wow. still here. And I was lying in that bed going, how did all my self-improvement get me here? <laughs> Something was missing with this picture. And but it wasn't enough to crack me open. You know, I figured oh, I must have to work harder or dig deeper or redouble my efforts. And so I did. And I ended up getting a little more progress and success. And I was doing a film in Jamaica and I got caught in this coral reef. I went out, everything started going sideways on the film and they were firing the director, firing the actors. And I went off and went diving in a reef alone, my first mistake. And I prayed to get lost from everything above my second mistake. And very quickly I got lost. I got trapped and nobody knew I was out there. And I was trapped in a pocket of fire coral and spiked coral that were inches from my throat and my chest and my neck. And I, I couldn't swim down. I couldn't look up. I couldn't move or I would have been punctured by this coral. And then nobody knew I was there. It, this ordeal lasted for a long time as I was having to swim with the tips of my fingers to stay at that water level breathe in short staccato breaths so that I wouldn't be punctured and eventually reached a point where I knew nobody was coming for me and I was never going to get out and I knew I was going to drown and it's hard to understand if you haven't experienced it but it wasn't like I hope I don't drown you know it was this is the end it was such a, a sense of finality and all that was left was to surrender and so I did I let go I was exhausted I was done and in that moment of total unconditional surrender, you know, I'd already tried the bargaining. Hey, you know, God, universe, if there's anything out there, I promise to go to church on Sunday if you get me out of this. <laughs> and that wasn't working. The universe was not making any deals. And all I could do was let go. And in that instant, some, there was like a flash and something cracked or snapped in me or cracked open in me. And I saw this guy that I've been trying to fix and improve for all these years was a fictional character, an amalgamation of parental fantasies and peer pressure and societal conditioning. And nothing I ever did was going to make him better. It was a fiction. It was just like, you know, adding more paint to a canvas, but it wasn't real. But behind that, there was a real me. And he had never been hurt or damaged. And so he didn't need to be fixed. He was already complete. So he couldn't be improved upon. And I didn't have the language for it then. It was a flash. It was like Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall. And when he cracked open, something came out of the shell, this light, this awareness. And at the same moment, 
I don't know if a wave came along or the water level just rose or I literally walked on water. But in the next moment, I was popped out of the reef, standing on a coral place that the only place they didn't have fire coral, looking down into the hole I'd been trapped for this whole ordeal. And the exit was just inches from me the whole time, but I couldn't see it. Huh. And I looked at this whole maze of coral and it was like, it was like a metaphor for my life. I'd been swimming through this maze, following all these brightly colored things. And I was trapped and I was drowning and I was gasping for air. And I realized that was a metaphor for my whole life and ultimately for many, many lives that I came to meet and teach. But in that moment of surrender, I popped out of this identity and out of this framework and I saw something much different and much bigger. And everything had this luminosity to it. And it was so radical of a shift that I pulled out of acting. I pulled out of everything I did, writing, acting, and I was going to become a monk. And uh, I tried to become a monk. After about a, less than a week in a monastery, I was fasting and silent, and I freaked out so badly that I broke into the monk's kitchen in the middle of the night and stole food out of the refrigerator. But So the monks kindly suggested maybe the monastic life wasn't for me. Wow. So I ended up closing myself in my apartment and I went on this several years journey of understanding that insight that I had, which we'll talk more about today. But I had to recalibrate myself around this new awareness of how life really works, how we're really meant to grow and unfold. And it's not what we've been taught. And it's why so many people suffer and struggle when they try to attract and achieve and strive that, you know, We'll definitely unpack it more, but I found really that how we're really designed to grow, which everything in nature grows this way, we've been doing it the opposite for most of the cases. Sometimes we accidentally align, but most of the time we're doing it where we're paddling up the stream instead of going with the, the right flow of how we're meant to grow. Wow. So tell me a little bit about that, Derek, because I took from your website that you're actually against a lot of this idea of self-help and self-improvement. So unpack that for me a little bit and tell me why that is. I mean, what is the proper way that we're supposed to be growing versus how we're actually doing it? Absolutely. And I, I want to just, I'll say one little thing. It's not that I'm against it. I'm not really against anything. <laughs> when you're against something, you actually create resistance and you end up creating the very thing you're against. So it's why Mother Teresa said, when they kept asking her to join anti-war rallies, she said, no, I'm not going to do that. But if you have a pro-peace rally, I'll be there. Wow. So you know the old saying, whatever you resist persists. Whatever you fight, you fuel. So I'm not against self-improvement in the ways we know it. There's a lot of good tools and strategies mm. in there. But I discovered that there's a different way. And what I discovered is, just as the oak tree or any tree is already in the seed, it's already in the acorn. The acorn doesn't go out and attract an oak. It doesn't struggle to achieve an oak. It doesn't have to make itself worthy to be an oak. When the acorn yields to the soil and the conditions in the soil match the pattern already in the seed, that pattern naturally emerges. And this is how all of nature operates. Nature, and ultimately we understand this from quantum physics, life is not attraction, life is not interaction, life is, we live in an emergent universe. And so nature is emergent. When the conditions come together and match the seed, that potential that's already there emerges. So I realized this is a fundamental principle of how all of life unfolds, and I saw that most of my efforts to achieve and attract and make stuff happen were coming from a premise and ultimately a mental, emotional, spiritual, physical, energetic condition that I was broken, that something was missing, something was lacking. I wasn't enough. I didn't have enough. Now I'm going to do all this stuff to be enough and get enough. And first of all, besides the fact that that premise is fundamentally untrue, mm -hmm. it's actually opposite of what's true. Just like everything is already in the seed for it to become the tree. Likewise, everything is already in us. And by the way, it's not just one oak tree that's in that acorn. It's entire groves of oak trees. Think about it. Out of that one seed, an oak emerges. It releases more acorns, more oaks. It's literally infinite. Within that one seed is an entire 
universe of oak trees. So the same is true for us. So I realized this, that even if when you are coming from that place, because the law of mind is always operating on what you actually believe, not what you are necessarily doing, but where you're coming from. And so you're trying to attract and achieve all this stuff. And even if you, through sheer will, manifest a bigger paycheck, you often just find yourself at a high, <laughs> broke at a higher income bracket. Right. Or you manifest a new house and you find yourself less at home. Or you manifest a new relationship and you end up in the same fights. Or you manifest a new job and you end up with the same jerky boss just wearing a different mask. <laughs> you know, I remember a woman who used all this attraction and achievement stuff to try to get out of her house and move to a new house in the Midwest because she didn't want to live in earthquake country. And she carried all that fear and resistance around that to her new house that she manifested. And then that house got taken out by a tornado. Wow. So, uh, and I see this happen over and over and over again. You know, I even jokingly say, you know, if you look at the timeline of when all of the law of attraction stuff happened and there was millions of people suddenly practicing to manifest bigger houses, better jobs and more money. And right on the tail of that, we had the biggest job, housing and financial collapse in 80 years. <laughs> now, is that an accident? Is that a coincidence? I don't know. But it's certainly interesting considering that you suddenly had millions and millions of people trying to attract things from a consciousness, from a mindset often that it wasn't there, that there was a lack, that there was a limitation. So the law of mind that's always operating on our belief magnifies our belief, whatever it is. If you believe, you know, the old saying, if you believe you can or you believe you can't, you're right. Or as, you know, one great master teacher, uh, one of our great prophets or whatever your religious beliefs are, Jesus said, it is done unto you as you believe. Mm -hmm. So this, that wasn't like a metaphysical trick to try to attract things. It was a mystical truth that the life, we don't experience life directly. We experience life through the filter of our perceptions and beliefs. That's what totally creates our experience. So this is what I really came to understand. I was like, wow, this is all backwards. No wonder I was almost killing myself and people are struggling so much. And even when they manifest stuff through struggle and achievement and attraction, they have a very hard time holding on to it. Or it just creates more problems, like the guy who manifested a Mercedes that I knew. And a few weeks later, it was in the shop again. And he was now trying to pray himself out of the thing he had manifested in his life because he had sort of attracted a Mercedes, but he had not embodied Mercedes consciousness. So this is what I became to understand, that it's already in me that this seed of infinite potential is already planted within us. Mm -hmm. And there's clues all around us to what it is. And when we start to come into harmony with it, when we create the conditions in our life that are in integrity with our soul or our true purpose or our true potential, it begins to naturally emerge and unfold. And I went from being broke and broken, really I was suicidal, and living in a one-room apartment, living off of 19 cents boxes of macaroni and cheese to ultimately million-dollar homes and world travel and a global transformational business. And it just all began – all the things I've been struggling for began to unfold. Now, it's not that there's not challenge. We can talk more about that. There's plenty of challenge. But there's a natural way that we're meant to grow and unfold. And this is what I discovered and began to share with wow. the world. So break it down for us. What is this natural way of growing and developing? Again, the idea is that there's a couple fundamental premises. The first one is that life is inside out, not outside in. From the emergence premise, mm -hmm. whatever's missing is what you're not giving because you have it already within you. And whatever you're waiting for, you're actually waiting with it and often weighing it down. Mm. So... So we want to begin to realize, in fact, the word human comes from a Sanskrit term, man, that means the dispenser of divine gifts. So our actual nature is that we're not here to get anything except for feedback and reflection. You know, the world's like a big mirror that shows us where we are in our mindset, or our consciousness. But we're not here to get anything. We're here to give something. We're here to share or shine or express or download, yeah. right? Absolutely. So we have to get in touch with, well, what is that thing we're here to be and become and give and download? And then we have to begin to make ourselves 
bring our life really, we, most of our lives have been designed by default, meaning, right. you know, we've designed a life based on self-preservation, protection. We don't want to get hurt. We don't want to lose something. It's been designed by default. And we want to create a life by design that's intentional and that is in integrity with the emerging power and possibility, our own unique superhuman capacities. We want to design a life that's now in integrity with that. Right. Because right now, the life most people have, it's designed to keep them where they are, not to get them where they want to go. Right. I always like to tell people, you know, you have a unique gift. I think I, I once heard it from Tony Robbins is like, you have a unique gift that no one else can give. And the sooner you figure out what that is, the sooner you're going to feel at home on this planet and find your purpose. Absolutely. When I teach people purpose work, People think a purpose is something you make up. No, it's what you're made of. It's like the acorn doesn't make up the oak. It's made of oak. You're made of, whether you call it divine stuff, universal stuff, superhuman stuff, you're made of a perfect pattern and just such perfect intelligence. And literally, you're a fully funded, fully franchised expression of the universe that brought everything you need. In fact, you know, they did a study on a tree. They took a tree, put it in like a tub with dirt. They measured the volume of the dirt and they did all the, you know, they watered, weeded, feeded, fed it, and it grew. And then they measured the volume of the dirt again and realized that the tree didn't take anything from the dirt to grow. Right. And they're like, where did it come from? Yep. It's literally, it's in the quantum field. And that's like now quantum physics is catching up to these principles where they're saying we live in a quantum field where everything is already there. And w through observation, the observer effect, you collapse this infinite potential into a particle, into an experience, and it manifests in your life. But it's already here. The oak is there in the field of the acorn. Your destiny of greatness and abundance and wealth and power, it's already here as a frequency that is as real and as broadcasting as music. In fact, just one little quick metaphor that I love because we can understand this. Right where we are right now, our favorite music is broadcasting on some station. It's right here in our field. It's literally we're being bombarded by broadcasts. But it's not manifest. But it's broadcasting. We can understand that. And when we tune the dial of our radio so that the frequency of our dial matches the frequency of that station, that music becomes manifest. In other words, to, to play on words, we have a manifest station. And that music wasn't in the distance. We didn't have to run down the street to catch it. It wasn't in the future. We didn't have to sit around and wait for it to show up on our receiver. It was already playing. But it wasn't a part of our experience until our frequency came into alignment with the frequency where the music was playing. Well, the same is true for everything in life. Everything is already broadcasting. And this is what the great masters, whether it's Jesus or Buddha or Krishna or when they talked about this thing is already here, you know, heaven is at hand, nirvana is already within you, the Tao is everywhere, you know, whatever the language and the idioms and cultural expressions, but it's the same truth. It's already broadcasting, it's already here. We have to come into alignment or integrity with it. And when we do that, it starts to manifest. Manifestation doesn't mean making something happen that isn't happening, it means making something visible and tangible that's already broadcasting in terms of a frequency. And so it becomes manifest in our life. And the great news about this is that it doesn't matter what's going on in the world, where you were planted, what side of the tracks, what conditions you're facing, none of that. And I really want people to understand this. None of that has any power to determine your potential. At best, it's creating a condition for you to get stronger you know, to develop your own superhuman superpowers like the spider that bites Spider-Man or the vat of, you know, radioactive material that the Hulk, David Banner, Bruce Banner falls into, whatever. You're, those negative conditions are creating the condition for you to activate and awaken to your deeper powers. But they never, ever have any power to stop you or to diminish you because you carry your capacity to create the right conditions with you. A seed is indigenous meaning it's determined by its external conditions, whether it thrives. We are endogenous, which means we are self-effulgent. We can bring our own light. 
no matter how many clouds are out, we can activate the soil of our soul. We can feed it and water it and weed our mind and our heart. And we can create the conditions in our life that are congruent with that destiny of greatness within us, no matter where we are or what's going on, and prove that we truly are unstoppable. And then we become the solution, the answer in those situations rather than waiting for it to come to us. Isn't that awesome? It is. So I assume that's what's described by the title of your book, The Law of Emergence. I wanted to ask, what is the subtitle about the seven steps to radically changing your life? Yeah, absolutely. So the book is called Emergence, Seven Steps for Radical Life Change. And the principle is the law of emergence. And uh, I also have a podcast by the same name called Emergence that where we, I break down these principles as well in a lot of different areas of people's lives. But the basic seven steps is a framework. It's like a template so that you can take this law of emergence and actually design a life and make it real for you. It's basically the steps of how to bring your life into integrity with who you really are, why you're really alive, and what's really the potential within you. That's what those seven steps do. And we can touch, I mean, obviously, it's a lot to try to cover all of them, but we can certainly touch upon them briefly, if you'd like. Yeah, I'd love that. So there's a few very key things here that this framework can be used. This is universal principle. So like this isn't something I made up. This isn't just some clever idea Derek cooked up in his basement. You know, this is actually based on two decades of research and, you know, studying all the great literature, success literature, spiritual, religious, philosophical, metaphysical, you know, all of it across the whole spectrum and discerning and discovering what's called the perennial teaching, which is what's the truth principles that are across the board. If you peel away the dogma, the doctrine, the cultural idioms of all the great religions and great philosophies, you begin to discover there are fundamental principles that everybody's talking about. It's just we haven't understood it or seen it because they're coming through all of these clothing that was designed for the people of those times to understand. And we've often misinterpreted along the way. But there's fundamental principles. So the first one, stage one, which you must begin with, is vision. You have to know what is the seed. If you don't know what the seed is, you can't know how to cultivate the soil for its proper growth, right? Right. Or as the proverb says, where there is no vision, the people perish. It doesn't say where there is no vision, people have a bad day. Where there is no vision, they don't lose those extra three pounds. You know, where there is no vision, they don't make six figures this year. No, it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. And the Gospel of Thomas says, if you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. So when we don't live our vision and tap into our vision and access and activate that power grid of our own being, that energy starts to wreak havoc in our life. And it creates most of the problems we struggle with, but then we try to solve the problem externally or extrinsically. Like, you know, it's like a tree. The problem is in the roots, but it shows up in the branch. You know, if you think of all the branches of a tree, like your health, your wealth, your work, your relationships, your emotions, and then you go and try to just solve that emotional issue or that financial issue, and you don't understand the problem is in the trunk or in the roots, meaning you're not rooted in who and what you really are and why you're alive. And so that energy of who you are is stagnant and it blocks the flow and then it shows up as breakdown and challenges and crises, all of which is trying to bring you back. So this first step is you got to discover what you're really here for, what your life is really about, what's trying to emerge in your life. And in the book and in my work, I walk you step by step through how to read the signs and how to discover what that is, I'll just tell you one little clue. Your deepest heart's desire is a sign, not of what's outside of you that you have to go get, but what's inside of you trying to get out. Desire comes from a root that means of the sire or of the father, of the creative principle. And it's telling you what is already true about you. Now, you may be seeing it through filters societal ideas of what you should or shouldn't be, but there's a fundamental impulse 
behind that desire that's telling you this is who you already are. This is what you already have. So that's a very powerful w- beginning entry point into discovering what it is that is trying to emerge in your life. What is that seed of potential? So step one, got to have vision. If you don't know where you're going, every road will take you there. You're just going to be lost, right? Step two, you now that you know what the seed is, which you know what the vision is, your best guess anyway, you have to create, cultivate the congruent conditions. So this is about beginning to cultivate the mindset, the heart set, you know, the way you think and feel, walk and talk. And ultimately, the people, places, things, and activities that you begin to surround yourself with. So you have to consciously redesign your life around to make it congruent. So if somebody was to look at your life and listen to your conversations, they would start to get a clue like, wow, like, for example, let's say your vision is abundance and success. And they'd go, wow, this person must really be abundant or successful or definitely on the road to that. If they were to listen to your conversations and the kind of people you hang out with and the kind of things you read and, and eat and do and walk and talk, they would start to see, wow, this person is really about something. But if we're honest, we say we have a vision of abundance, you know, we have, we're affirming it, we have vision boards, we have a plan, whatever. But then we walk around and we have conversations either inside ourselves or with other people about how hard the economy is, how bad things are, that there's not enough work to go around, or we want a new partner, you know, a beautiful new relationship. But then we talk about how there's not enough good men to go around or not enough good women to go around. Well, that's inconsistent. That's out of integrity. It's like this, the metaphysical saying, you can't make a demand on life that exceeds your belief about it, you know, or again, to use a biblical saying, and these, by the way, none of this is ever religious. This is just principle. If you, you're serving two masters and you become a house that is divided and a house that is divided cannot stand, it has no structural integrity. Right. When you're like saying, I want a life of wealth and success and abundance and power and health, but your mental, emotional, physical reality that you've designed and are living in every day doesn't match that you are out of integrity and you cannot create that in your life. It's like the radio analogy. You want to get onto station K rich, K R I C H, but Hmm. everything you're doing is tuning you into K L A C K K lack. And you're wondering why all you hear is the blues (laughs) and you want to tune into the rock and roll or whatever your musical taste is. So that's what's happening. You're tuning out of the frequency of what you say you want based on the conversations you have, the, the environment you create, the people you interact with, et cetera. So we have to consciously and intentionally design that. That's step two. Step three then is we have to put it all together into what I call a quantum plan, which is designing now, you know, you, you've got to, again, you want to live on purpose, not on accident. Most people don't even ever get clear on why they're here. Even less people actually design a way of life that starts to be congruent with that. And even fewer people actually write it down make it real, make it a plan. A vision without a plan is a fantasy, right? You know, a plan without putting it on your calendar is wishful thinking. And we have to have a backbone, not a wishbone. And so we have to be willing to do the sometimes very difficult work for a lot of people to actually make this real now. So if you really want to develop a mindset that's congruent and a an inner feeling tone that matches the life you want to live so that you start to feel like you're already living it. You have to have a practice. You have to have a daily practice that is not subject to the whims of your emotions. You know, it's not like, Oh, I don't feel like it today. Well, that's, that's actually a cognitive disorder called emotional reasoning. (laughs) So we have to live our life based on vision, not based on emotional reasoning, not based on the, the, the tides and tempests and whims of whatever's going on in our life. That's if you look at anybody that's truly achieved something great, they've developed the discipline to do what they need to do to do the right things, even when they don't feel like it, especially when they don't feel like it, because that's how you build character, right? Mm. And character determines destiny, not your conditions. Your conditions are just a starting point, not even karma or astrology or any of that ologies. None of that determines your destiny destiny. They just determine starting points. Your habits, really your focus and commitment determines your habits. Your habits determine your character and your character determines your destiny. So we have to build these habits and so that until they become subjective. And the only way to do that 
is to create a real practice. That's part one. We have to have a practice so that we are inoculating ourselves from the viruses of the human thinking, which is filled with so much limitation and fear and separation, so that we're creating like a, an, an immunization against that through our daily practice of knowing what's true, tapping into who we are, building that inner stamina and resilience mentally, emotionally, vibrationally, spiritually, whatever works for you. Then we have to have a real plan in terms of the outer activities. If you say you want to write a book, you should be writing every day. Definitely. You know, a writer writes, a painter paints, a teacher mm -hmm. teaches, a singer sings. You, if you say to me, well, I don't know where to sing. I don't have any gigs. Put a concert on for your cat. Right. I mean, you know, I'm speaking now and I speak all over the place now, but there was a time when nobody was knocking on my door, but I was literally, I remember it was a joke. We'd be on a road trip and my wife would wake up and look over at me and I'd be giving a talk. And I didn't <laughs> even realize I was doing it. Eventually, I didn't even know I was doing it. She'd just look over and I'm just like gesticulating and I'm like, you know, my mouth's moving and I'm not saying it out loud, but I'm, I'm actually like speaking to an audience, you know? So I, I just started doing it. You know, I know Brendan Burchard, who many of you probably know, he used to just walk around in his underwear just giving talks to nobody, you know? <laughs> and now he gives talks to everybody. So you got to start where you are and begin to do it. You know, I remember my kids when they were younger and they wanted, it's like, I'm going to grow up. I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm like, what are you going to do about it today? You know, it's like, well, I need some money to go to the mall. No, what are you going to do about it today? It's like, go start a lemonade stand and practice. And I remember one kid did that and then he franchised his lemonade stand. He literally got other kids around the neighborhood wow. to do it. And I'd invest in that kid. Right? So we got to build a life that is surrounded by the people, places, things, and activities and inner life and inner practice that is where we want to be and want to go, not based on where we've been or even where we are. So Definitely. That's the quantum plan. So those first three stages are the foundation, right? And we don't have to go into too much detail about the rest, except the rest is where, well, even once you do that, there's a few very important things that stop people, that block people, that send them off the rails. And even when you have the vision and you have the congruence and you have the plan and you're living it, the fourth stage is that whatever's missing is what you're not giving. And we touched upon this, but just understanding that stage, it changed my life forever. Definitely. And it's really, it's the fundamental teaching of all the great teachings. And that is that you have everything within you. Definitely. That, Like I said before, the world can't give you anything and the world can't take it away. You literally, when you walk into a room, the only thing you can meet is what you bring. And likewise, when you walk into a relationship, the only thing you can meet is what you bring. When it comes to relationships, two halves do not make a whole, you know, H-A-L-V-E-S. Two halves, H-A-V-E-S, that's now we're talking because you bring to the relationship what you want to experience in it. And again, we could do a whole day talking about this mm -hmm. alone, but but this is critical. This is everything. If you get this and realize that life is happening through you and from you, that you're not on your way to a better life, that you're not on your way to heaven or to abundance or to whatever, that you're coming from it. That you're, like, you know, the sunbeam is not on its way to the sun. It's literally coming from the sun. It's an expression of the sun. You are an expression of abundance, of life, of love, of power of genius. You're not on your way to it. You are it expressing. And it's like knocking on the door of your mind and heart and saying, let me out. And so we have to let it out. You know, like the poem Robert Browning called the imprisoned splendor. We have to release it. Stage five is all about action. And the key here is that we've learned that you, have, you take a bunch of action to get stuff, to make stuff happen. And in here, I show you that, no, you use action to make something welcome. Mm -hmm. You use action as sort of a moving affirmation so that you bring your physical life into harmony with what's true about you even before it shows up. So you're not trying to do a bunch of stuff to try to manipulate and, and make stuff happen. You're doing stuff to live into the vision of what's true about you. And like I said before, you're singing because that's what you are. You're writing because you're a writer. You're, you're doing, you're living into it. You're not trying to make it happen. You're using action as another critical piece to tune into that station, to become, as Gandhi said, 
the change you want to see in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then stage six, and this is another one of the biggest revelations and breakthroughs. It's one of the most requested pieces of work around the world when I talk or teach is embrace what appears broken. And this is based on the understanding that there's nothing about you that's broken or missing, that everything you think is bad or wrong about you, that you've been living your life trying to deny, ignore, avoid, repress, reject, fix, change, pray over, affirm over, achieve over, none of those things are bad or wrong. The neediness, the greediness, the selfishness, the sadness, the grief, the depression, the anger, all of those are misunderstood aspects of you that are actually containing most of the gold and the power and your unique superhuman traits that you've been denying and striving to achieve. And I'll give you a quick analogy to understand it. The soil is made up of everything that is dyed and decayed and rotted. And the more of that, the more fertile it is. And the soil is also the source and the substance of most of all life on earth. I mean, it's the basis of all life on earth. Obviously, you need some other ingredients. You need water, light. But without the soil, you don't get growth. And so if a seed tried to grow the way we've learned through self-improvement and in all kinds of achievement, it would try to get rid of all the dirt, all the gross, smelly, yucky, dirty stuff. And if it succeeded at that, you know, and stood triumphant on a rock, I'm free at last. All the dirt is gone. I'm clean. Finally, the sun would come out and shine its light and burn the seed to a crisp. So instead, the seed buries itself in the dirt and it turns it not into a tomb, but a womb. And when the sun shines now, it activates the life that's already inherent in that darkness, in that dirt, and it nourishes the seed. And then when the seed grows, how does it grow? Again, most of us in spirituality or consciousness or self-help, we all want to grow up, 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 grow to the light, ascend off the planet, become ascended masters, you know, and that's not how growth happens. The seed grows down, down, down into the dark mm -hmm. and the deeper the roots, the taller the shoots and the richer the fruits. So this stage six is, begins to train us and teach us that all the darkness within us all these things we've been feeling shame and guilt and pain around carrying with us and trying to get rid of is the soil. It's like the soil of our greatest potential. When you embrace these qualities, they reveal their gifts and their talents and their treasures. And you start to activate all the stuff you've been struggling to achieve. And you realize I was never broken. There was never anything wrong with me. It was all just a misunderstanding. It was a misperception somewhere along the line. You know, I wanted what I wanted as a kid. And mommy said, stop being so selfish. Don't you see how busy mommy is? And it so scared me and shamed me that I decided that wanting what I want is bad. Selfishness is bad. So I'm going to repress that. And I'm going to create a counterbalancing characteristic of being mommy's little helper, a do-gooder, a caretaker, a giver, which, by the way, develops that talent and ability, which is wonderful. But it's to the exclusion of this whole other part of you that's suffering. And then you grow up to be a giver and a caretaker. You feel burned out, resentful, overwhelmed, pissed off, depressed. You become addicted and you wonder what the heck's going on. And you try harder and harder and it just gets worse and worse. But the problem is you've discarded a whole major part of yourself. And when you embrace the selfish shadow, you actually activate a level of self-care and self-fulfillment and self-love and respect that has been missing all along. And then what happens is because people treat you the way you train them based on how you treat yourself, mm -hmm. because you're now taking better care of yourself, people in life reflect that back to you. So this is just one example, but all these parts of us that we've been rejecting and trying to get rid of and think are bad and shameful are just, it's just gold. It's just a gold mine waiting to be excavated. And in this stage, I show you how to go in there and excavate this gold. So you can start to walk around and wake up feeling like you are enough, you have enough, there's nothing wrong with you, and you can get off the treadmill of thinking you're broken and now you have to fix yourself. Brilliant. Self-improvement is an oxymoron. You cannot improve the self when you understand its real nature. You can only discover it, uncover it, come into alignment with it, and allow more and more of it to emerge. 
The final piece is step seven, wait on the law. And the basic idea here is that even when you do all this stuff, you're going to bump into what I call thresholds. And these are an evolutionary artifact of the ego is that it was originally designed to ensure our survival. So if we were to change too quickly, it's just a set of programs. If we were to change too quickly, we would actually, you know, move to the wrong place that we don't even understand and and end up starving or freezing or running into the enemy. Or, you know, if we didn't have a sense of separation from things, we would go pet a saber tooth cat and get become its lunch. So it created a sense of separation and this sense of slow change so that we would evolve and survive and actually the human experiment would work. But now that same mechanism that helped us to survive puts us on the verge of extinction often and in our own life prevents our evolution. So what happens as you do all these things I just said, that ego pattern is going to go, oh my God, they're about to really change. They're about to become really different, (laughs) which to the ego is equivalent to death. Right. Because literally the program is going to get erased or, you know, real change is like a virus to the system software. So the ego starts throwing out its arsenal to try to keep you from changing. And it looks like, you know, oh, my God, I don't I'm just too tired or this is too hard or I don't, I don't have enough support, time, money, whatever. And it comes up with all these very, you know, rational excuses. And, you know, when you rationalize, you're just telling yourself rational lies, but it sounds and feels very real. Hmm. And that's what I call the threshold. And if you buy into it, it's like the plane, you're driving the runway and you're starting to get the liftoff speed. What starts to happen? The plane starts to shake. And if you don't understand aerodynamics, you think something's wrong and you'll slow down. And if you keep slowing down every time you're about to get liftoff, you're going to just keep circling the runway. And that's what most people do. They do all the right stuff up to that point. The cockpit starts shaking. They, stuff starts coming up. All these things try to tempt them to believe it's not working. It's too late. I'm not enough. I don't have enough. I don't know enough. My acorn shell is cracking. Something's wrong. I need to just fix the shell and become just a good nut in the forest. You know. But there's something much bigger trying to emerge. And we slow down. We back away. We change courses. We follow another shiny object. And before we know it, we're back to where we started and we're circling the runway and we never get liftoff speed or escape velocity or momentum. And and that's why the average person doesn't live 70 to 90 years. They live the same year 70 to 90 times, (laughs) right? So this stage, I help you to understand that phenomenon so that you can make real, lasting, permanent change and then take your whole life to a new level permanently. Then you begin the cycle again, you know, as you go to the next level, the next level. Fantastic. Derek, I think we've gotten a really solid overview of the book and of the principles. If people want to obviously read the book, learn more about you, check out your podcast, stuff like that, where should we be sending them? Yeah, they can absolutely grab the book on, you know, Amazon and they can grab my podcast on iTunes, Emergence. And uh, actually, check this out because we do have a special thing going on right now, depending on when you're listening to this. If you go to getemergencebook.com, that's G-E-T-E-M-E-R-G-E-N-C-E book, B-O-O-K.com, all one word, getemergencebook.com. I'm giving the book away right now. All you have to do is is pay just a small shipping and handling cost just to cover. It doesn't even actually cover my cost, but it's to kind of help it a little bit. But I'm giving it away. So you can go there, get your free copy. Awesome. We appreciate that. Absolutely. And then again, go to Emergence Podcast and get uh, over 100 you know, trainings around how to apply Emergence to your life. Amazing. Derek, thank you so much for that. And we typically like to close on one specific question, which is if people take away one life lesson from this episode and they carry it with them for the rest of their lives, one, one life lesson, what would you hope for it to be out of all the things you shared with us today? Absolutely. Oh, there was one other thing I want to say. If you want to get also some additional emergence training, you can just go to lawofemergence.com as well. So yeah, you know, there's so much, but if there was one thing I had to share is that it's really true that everything you could ever want, hope for, desire, or need is already in you. And it's also really true 
that you have a destiny of greatness and you really do have superpowers. Like you really, you are walking around with a gold mine, a treasure house, a level of power and abundance and genius that if, as Rumi said, if you could see who you really are, you would bow before yourself and worship the ground you walk on. Wow. And I just invite you to just contemplate that, journal about that and ask yourself every day for the next seven days, if this is true about me, that I have everything, that I really am carrying brilliance and genius and power beyond my imagination, how would I hold myself today? How would I show up today? How would I walk into work today? How would I walk into my family today? If I really had everything I could ever need and I was this brilliant, this beautiful, this powerful, and you are, I'm not just giving you a sweet little affirmation. How would I begin to show up today? If you just practice that, you're going to have some breakthroughs. I love it. Derek, thank you so much for sharing your time and your wisdom with us today. I know our audience has definitely gotten a hefty dose of motivation and inspiration. So thank you so much. Thank you, man. I so appreciate the work you're doing. I love your podcast and I love, I just so honor you for showing up, man. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Derek. So do keep in touch and let me know if there's any way I can help you do what you're doing. Likewise, my brother. All righty. You take care. You too. All right, super friends, that's it for this week's episode. We hope you really, really enjoyed it and learn a ton of applicable stuff that can help you go out there and overcome the impossible. If so, please do us a favor and leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher or however you found this podcast. In addition to that, we are always looking for great guest posts on the blog or awesome guests right here on the podcast. So if you know somebody or you are somebody or you have thought of somebody who would be a great fit for the show or for our blog, please reach out to us either on Twitter or or by email. Our email is info at becomingasuperhuman.com. Thanks so much. Thanks for tuning in to the Becoming Superhuman podcast. For more great skills and strategies, or for links to any of the resources mentioned in this episode, visit www.becomingasuperhuman.com slash podcast. We'll see you next time.